Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. I'm hoping Teddy Bear comes to give a cameo. He's a few rooms over. He wanted to say good morning to you, too. Good morning. I hope he was the first person to write on the thread. Hey, Ted. <laughs> Carol, good to see you. You're here early. You're off gallivanting and you miss that. It's great to gallivant. It's the right weather for it. You know, I'm just thinking as we go through these days, I was walking with Jocelyn yesterday. We left the studio and we walked across to the, there's a gas station there that we call Gassies. And we get our scratch tickets there when we're feeling lucky and we get an ice cream always. And I, I said to her, you know, doesn't, she's such a little girl, but she's so um, sort of emotional and in touch. And I said, doesn't it feel so strange that it wasn't that long ago we were freezing cold um, and now, you know, it's not only warm, it was very comfortable yesterday. Now we're walking around dressed with hardly anything on and it's just comfortable. And isn't life just so funny? You know, it, just the seasons and the cycles of life. We're so lucky here that we live in a part of the country where we have so many seasons and so many changes because it is exciting. And I noticed online um, this weekend, a lot of people starting fall projects and even holiday projects in the different groups. And I thought, yeah, it's just the, it's the, the nature of human beings, isn't it? To always be on that bridge and always be looking at the thing that's right ahead because it's so, uh, it's so nice to feel that anticipation and suspense, right? But it has been beautiful here and, and it is the season to gallivant. In fact, I'm hoping I'm gonna finish all my orders in the next hour so I can take the kids to the ocean. In Connecticut, we have a, a beautiful beach called Hamanasset and uh, we haven't been this year. I mean, we've been to the ocean, but we haven't been there this year. We typically pair it with going to one of those food places after with, they have a little carousel and ice cream and some food and sometimes I can sneak uh, something unexpected to Teddy's like he accidentally eats clams and things because he thinks they're chickens, that kind of thing. So I'm hoping that happens for us and we can gallivant later today too. Christine, good to see you. Vacation day. Oh, isn't that great? Good for you. Kirsten, there you are. Happy Monday. Working on so many projects. Donna in Alberta, happy Monday. Good to see you. Tara, good to see you. Happy Monday. Anita, there you are, 84 degrees. Yeah, that's warm, huh? Good afternoon, Anita. And Catherine in Idaho, great to see you. Robin, great to see you. Jenny, great to see you in Texas. Thank you for your message. You can write me absolutely anywhere. I'm always happy to get messages all over the place. Anywhere is perfect. Linda, good to see you in New Jersey. Super summery day. Yes, please thumbs up for the video. Speaking of which, I posted, I'm not gonna wind myself up. I'm gonna try, I posted that video yesterday of Jocelyn um, because I was announcing the ice cream collection that um, I finished the swatch set. And it is this set here that I'm about to cut up into swatches. There's eight sets right here. I think I've, we're almost there. So if you want them, make sure you grab them. I'm just deciding what the secret mystery pattern is going to be. But, you know, Jocelyn, yesterday I realized that when she did her tap class um, a couple months ago downstairs at the tap studio, they had, they had me buy, you know, their costume. And the costume was that ice cream waitress, like a diner waitress with a little ice cream cone. And I thought, man, that was a lot of money to spend for her to wear that one time. And they didn't have a live recital, they had a filmed recital. So I thought, you know what, brainstorm, let's get that costume back on that little body. And I brought her over to where Jay does photographs of like big stuff for auctions. And we recorded that little video and I posted it. And I guess YouTube knows that it's a child, like an adolescent voice. And um, so they locked it for commenting. But so, like 20 people commented overnight and one idiot gives the thumbs down to that little girl. I mean, I can't even show her the video at this point because she's going to go, oh, somebody gave me a thumbs down. It's like, why would somebody give a little child wearing a costume showing rug hooking supplies a thumbs down? It's just such a crappy world sometimes. I just don't get it. I was super wound up when I saw that this morning. It made me want to kill, you know. Whew. I guess I did wind myself up. Linda, good to see you. Janice, good to see you. Good morning. Beverly, great to see you. Fog and wind and the beach in um, in Washington. Ooh, sounds, it, that sounds um, rugged for sure. Susan, Kansas, great to see you. <laughs> I'm hoping that little man comes to say hi. Doreen, happy, happy Monday in upstate New York. Chrissy, it was a great cocktail night. Wasn't it fun? I mean, it was, it was supposed to be shorter and it wasn't shorter. I have to make my mouth stop, put a little lip zipper on it. But 
um, it was fun. It was very relaxing. I liked the smaller card, and I really liked looking at things that people had sent in. It made a big difference to me because I knew the people who, had, who sent them in, and it was, for me, way more special looking at them and seeing so many people live um, who had sent in their beautiful rugs. It's so... It's just so good to share that stuff and look at each other's work. There's a hundred at least good things to say about every piece that was sent in. So it's so nice to get the opportunity because I don't always have the opportunity to be online on our Facebook group, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. I don't always have the time to comment on every single thing. Um, so it was nice to have that chance to look piece by piece at these different rugs, all unique, all special, and to pick out some interesting um, and you know special things about each one to talk about during bingo. Really enjoyed it. Lots of winners. So yeah, that was so much fun, Chrissy. I, I just loved that. Jennifer, great to see you. Barbara, great to see you. And Debbie, great to see you. Barbara, I've got to get to work on that Van Gogh chair, and I'm going to be promoting it a lot more in the group so more people know about it. I did start um, writing around in this general area, some of the historic towns that have little galleries on the green type situations. I did start writing this weekend to a few people that I had in mind. Um, that might want to do or, or host the exhibit of the Van Gogh rugs, whatever you end up doing. Uh, Barbara came up with this great idea using the Van Gogh, the blank chair that I don't have handy, but everybody doing their own version of that Van Gogh chair with something in it, not with something in it, very literal, total departure, anything. Um, and I wanted to put any, any of the rugs that people send to me up in an exhibit, an actual exhibit. So not everybody will be able to attend, but you know I'll take a great video, and you know in terms of confidence and excitement and everything good that it gives you to know your work is on display somewhere for people to see, that whole event would be well documented and so nice for people um, in other places and beginners who are submitting work to have your work actually hanging up and showing somewhere where people are walking by and enjoying it. Um, so I am well, I am well into that project. Let's see, Cindy, good morning. Good to see you. Debbie, good morning. Upstate 2. Anne in Calgary, good to see you. Karen, great to see you in Stratford, Connecticut. Doreen, okay, oh, you're exchanging info. That's great. So what do I have to tell you this morning? I just wrote a bunch of things on my bulletin board with, um, with red chalk, and I cannot read them at all. So that was clever of me, huh? Um, I just wanted to remind you, um, I put up this weekend, wow, uh, the Maude Lewis class, Designing Like Maude Lewis. I put that up for Wednesday, August 18th, and Sunday, August 22nd. There's a ton of sign up for that already. Two different dates. It's a two-hour class designing like Maude Lewis. So, for example, as I said before, Maude Lewis's work as of January 1st of this year is copyright free, is out of copyright. But... Um, I'm not doing literal interpretations of her work, although you can. Um, I was kind of mixing, mixing things. So I'm working on this. I showed you this before, larger, this sort of the thing I consider the boomerang. I think I did this in bingo night, the boomerang tree. And I just bought some more fabric from Diane because she's been doing such a good job supplying things and dyeing the most exquisite colors. I'm going to do this in at least mostly velvet, if not all velvet. And I'll put this out as a kit much bigger. Um, the boomerang flowers, which are actually not leaves, but flowers, uh, little leaves around them, and then uh, three different butterflies. Hey, Jill. Oh, good. You're going to like this episode. And then I did this one that was like um, more of a landscape, but really pronounced dip in the hill, which is one of Maud's sort of signature things, and the sort of triangle trees and little triangle evergreens, perfect sort of cone shapes. And then I started working on this one. I'm going to show it to you now. The two cats, the signature cat, so the black cat with the big yellow eyes, and then she often does a white cat or a mixed cat. And then in the back, very stylized tulips, just a few. This one to me is the Maud Lewis layer cake. I might even name it that. Because you've got two of her classic motifs here, two cats, flowers, and then the hail with the pronounced dip in it, right? And then the bay, that's another one. Uh, the sort of little shelves in the distance, the two islands, and then the tree line, and then a bit of sky with the birds, the little sea ever-present pre seagulls, right? So I want to show you that because I've been working on that. Here's, that's my back to that. I, I mean, I just started it. This is going to be the front. And you can see I've got my cats, um, I've got to move, I've got to move the thing up a bit but I've got the cats down at the bottom. And it is very shape driven. I'm doing this very sort of abstract. This is not meant to look like a Maude Lewis painting. It's meant to look like a hat tip 
to a Maude Lewis painting. So I've got that all coming together. I'm getting the sort of highlights in the water going in and I just dyed this fabric yesterday. I didn't have anything just right. And in the sky part, this is all one piece of the cake here. I've got the sort of icy periwinkle color that goes into this multi orange. So there's a lot of multis in here. This is a multi in the background. This is one of the colors that we're doing in our dye class coming up. Um, this one in the background behind the flowers. I outlined the flowers in green. I'm, re I'm rethinking everything, but for this moment, I'm really liking it. I also wanted to point out to you, this is one of these Amy Oxford frames. This is, this is very large. They come in three or four sizes, but this is one of the Amy Oxford lap uh, frames, and it does have the combs that wrap around the edge. You always want them to wrap around the edge. So it's basically something that comes in a box. You put it together in five seconds, like this. Thanks, Suze. Um, and, and, you know, you stretch anything across it. This is a, one of the larger sizes. I have one that's even larger than this, but, uh, and there's smaller ones too, but I can't tell you, you know, in terms of shopping for a frame or thinking about a new frame, if it's in your budget, I put the link to these Amy Oxford frames on this video, but I'll tell you what, this has been, I've been punching this, right? This is a punch, punch job I've got going, but in terms of ease of use, um, it, and being adaptable, this frame for me, it doesn't have a stand, obviously. You balance it against the table, you balance it against something. I balance it, I sit on the couch, same as always, but instead of melting into the couch cushion like a prawn, I tip this against the edge, the armchair edge of it, so it's at an angle and I just punch away. And it is super, super, super fast and easy. So I'm really enjoying this kind of frame, and I don't know if you're aware that this exists but again all different sizes it comes in and she ships it immediately and it is a super super very easy frame to work with if you're wondering can you also use it for rug hooking I would I would consider certainly using that one might be uh, too big to use for rug hooking just in terms of getting your arm under it really depends on the logistics of what you're leaning it against and where you're sitting and how you're sitting you could certain there's no reason why you can't use this kind of a frame for rug hooking I would think the smaller one for rug hooking would be the best the smallest one she sells because however whatever you're leaning it against you could easily get your hand right up under it feeding the wool and pulling it up on top so in that regard it would work super well if you feel that you've got sort of a go-go gadget arm and you can get under one of the really large sizes you should give it a try because they really are great frames if you're a combination punch punch or hooker um, you know it is a good idea to get one of these put it on your wish list you know because um, it really is remarkably uh, easy to use and opens up different possibilities like we always say when you get sitting the same way you get using the same hook um, these you know you, you do the same thing over and over and you do it for many hours a day you're going to start to hurt so it is nice to sort of branch out look at different kinds of frames different styles of frames that get you sitting differently even if it's a hair it's going to make a big difference to your back to your neck to everything so I'm really enjoying using that frame and I've listed it right there in the video with a bunch of the other things we've just been talking about let's talk about this great book I'm going to be talking about this book all week Hooked Rugs of the Midwest A Handcrafted History by Mary Collins Burreal this is uh, the link to this book, the Amazon affiliate link to this book is also in the thread description of this video you're watching. This is another fantastic book uh, put out by one of my favorite presses, I think my favorite history press. These are the people who do so much um, with department store history, amusement park history, uh, all the sort of towns. Your town is probably done by history press. They do the postcard version that's all photos and then they usually do a history version for most towns no matter how small the town is. History Press is fantastic, uh, and they do have their own website, but they also sell, of course, on Amazon. This book is available on Amazon. This is a nice, small, uh, Kirsten says it does work, but the time I noticed and fixed it. Um, okay, something, something technical. I'm gonna bow out of that one, because you know me. Um, this is a real little gem. Uh, Jennifer said this morning, you, you ordered this book when I first mentioned it, I'm finally getting to it. It is a real gem, and I haven't gotten through the entire thing by any means, but I want to introduce you to this book because it really is packed with information. It has a slant, obviously, toward the Midwest, talking about rugs that are specifically from this area, this part of the country. Um, it's got a lot of history, and it's got a slightly different history. The slant goes right through the core of the book. She talks about the big players. Um, she, you know, She'll talk about all the people that we typically talk about, Frost, 
um, all, Burnham, all of these people, but a little bit less, and she talks more about people who are from the Midwest, who we hear less about and know less about, and in some cases know nothing about. So there's a lot of new information that emerges in this book because of its sort of regionalized focus. Now, she introduces the book with this great quote from a publication called American Hook Drugs, published in 1921. This is a quote in the introduction. One of the most characteristic arts of America has been that of rug making, strips of cloth being drawn back and forth between the meshes of a burlap foundation. A design is marked upon the burlap, and the various portions of the design are filled with cloths of various colors. As the rugs in use became worn, they were relegated to the kitchen, to the pantry, or even to the stable, which accelerated their ruin. So, um, so true, right? So many reasons why they have fallen by the wayside over the years. But um, I thought that was a lovely quote. She introduces the book by saying, handmade rugs have graced North American homes since the mid-1800s and the textiles still have the power to evoke times past when everything was better and everybody knew it. Oh, isn't that a great start? That's the first sentence of the book. The quote aside, that's the first sentence of the book. And everybody knew it. So true, so evocative. You know, you already know from the first sentence that she is number one, a storyteller, and number two, you're gonna get a very romantic uh, and well-written walk through rug hooking history. Other than people, uh, other than perhaps a spinning wheel, few utilitarian items evoke the 19th century as well as a rug and a dozy cat resting in front of the hearth. Isn't this perfect? She's setting up word pictures, word stories to put into your memory museum next time you're thinking about cozy things. You know, she, she uses such beautiful language in this book because she's a beautiful writer. And um, that reminds me, I have got to put down the date for our um, next book club. Uh, Tracy Chevalier did write back. She does not have the time to do a book thing now. Uh, she's super busy. She is one of the most famous writers currently, right? But it was very nice of her to write back and she wrote a nice email back, not like a one-liner. Um, so she wished us very good luck re looking at the book, but she said her schedule is so chock-a-block right now, um, she can't think. So understandable. So I'm going to put a date on um, the Tracy Chevalier book. What's that called? A Single Thread? I'm, I haven't started it yet, but I know a few people have finished it and have loved it. Um, if you would like to help um, by writing questions or hosting um, at least part of that evening, that would be amazing. It's a lot for me to have another project like that, and I want to do it, and I'm reading the book and certainly participating. But if you want to be in touch and say, listen, I'd like to pose a few questions during that evening, I can shift the hosting from one person to the next to the next kind of a thing. Anyway, that was my book-related thought for that moment. You finished the book, Jill. You loved it. Um, it was Martha who picked this book. Um, no, Marsha. Marsha. Marsha who picked this book. And, again, I've only heard good things about it. I've read, I think, all of Tracy Sfralier's books, but not this one yet. So I'm super excited to get into it. I'm very spoiled that last month at our first book club meeting, we had the author. And, and, and she was so good. She read from the book. Um, she really helped... Uh, with the shape of the evening in terms of what we talked about. But I will do well. I hosted a book club um, right up until COVID. So I got this. But if you feel like you'd like to pose some questions and take over the leadership of the Zoom call, um, I would love to kind of do a carousel of people asking different questions and taking over so I can sit back and have some sips and relax a little bit too, just as an idea. So back to this amazing book. Um, she talks a bit, just nutshell, about the history of rugs in the Southwest and the Native American influence of design out there. And then she poses the question, but what of the Midwest? How did the rug, more particularly the hooked rug, arrive in this region? A place of enormous variety, both culturally and geographically. That's a great point. The Midwest is shaped by rivers, prairies, weather, music, blues and ragtime, sunflowers, buffalo, the great western trails, and millions of threads that weave the immense web of culture around Native Americans, emigrants, and immigrants alike. Great sentence there, right? The Midwest is flat and hilly, rural and urban, reserved and ebullient, conservative and wildly experimental. 
Its colors are the colors of barns and sky, golden wheat, farm ponds, red clay, red brick, steel, glass, and foundations. In the 19th century, the Midwest was described as being west of the Ohio River and east of the Missouri River. So it's quite a description, isn't it? It's like, it's so sterile when you hear, when you hear that. Although today it encompasses a huge area, sometimes including Wisconsin, Minnesota, Kansas, Nebraska, and even parts of the Upper South and Southwest. The Midwest is nearly impossible to define or depict. So ha th this is kind of like a having said that lead into the actual text of the book. Um, she says, and like all good stories, the history of the hook drug in the Midwest is a colorful rag bag of romance, folklore, myth, and common sense. So you see what you're getting here. It's a good book and it's a good read. Um, oh, you finished it too, Barbara. That's great. That's great. And you know, she is showing right through the book, lots of beautiful color pictures, illustrations like this, right? You see that? I'll tell you who that is in just a second. Beautiful pictures of supplies and finished work. Um, that top one was adapted from a Currier and Ives lith lithographed title, The Happy Family. Uh, shows a grouse in its woodland habitat. The artist hand dyed the wool and used uh, number three cuts. Designed by Joan Moshimer and hooked by the author. Um, no, not the author. Uh, no, Margaret Collins Burreal. Margaret, I've got Margaret and Mary. So I'm wondering, that poses some other questions. Let me show you the happy family a little bit closer up. There we go, how cute is that? What a cute title too, look at all those little chicks down below. I don't know if that's what the babies are called in this case, but since they're birds, I'm guessing something like that. So then she gets into the foundation and she talks for a while um, about pretty universal subjects relating to the history of rug hooking, um, not not specifically in regard to the Midwest. So I'm kind of skipping over that because I want to talk about the things in this book that are unique to this book, and that is the Midwest flavor. She shows beautiful illustrations like this. Uh, the caption for this is, hooked rugs may have been made from rags, but this late 19th century Missouri example shows that even an old rug can be treasured enough to be patched and reused. Isn't that sweet? Just a little thing, right? Just a little thing, a little bit of a geometric going on. But you can see it's got those three patches on it at least. And people have been using it and reusing it and loving it throughout. Now, she goes into a fantastic history of um, the, the bed rug. Snug as a bug in a rug, right? So I'm going to hold on that because I have a companion book about, specifically about bed rugs, and I want to tackle bed rugs as their own subject. But I have to say, in this book, the author does a noble job of um, documenting the bed rug and talking about its importance in the rug hooking timeline. So that exists here, but that is a future episode for us. She also shows this beautiful example. Midwestern primitive style relies on repeated shapes contour hooking and rich warm colors. Designer Kelly, uh, sorry, Sally Callen, K-A-L-L-I-N, draws her inspiration from the natural world of Minnesota. In this rug, she includes oak leaves, berries, and mysterious central flower called a padula in the rug hooking world. I'll show you in just a second. The background offers a sense of plowed fields after the harvest. So um, Sally's company is called Pine Island Primitives. And this is the image. And I like what the author has said about the colors, you know, the signature colors of a Midwest rug. I like the idea of those plowed harvest fields in the background. I like that diamond central design. Too often we go straight to the oval, right? There's a lot to be said about the diamond. You can see that this is one of these designs that if you folded it over and flipped it, it's identical, right? So then you're playing with the colors of the background of this big central diamond motif, the pedula flower in the center, um, and then the sort of trumpet flowers hanging down, little bits of sprigs, but all the sort of multicolors in these leaves, the elongated uh, oak leaves, just a beautiful piece. And I think a really good choice uh, to show in this book as a signature Midwestern piece, because I agree the composition, the elements and the colors are all really screaming Midwest. So she talks about the rug in chapter two. Uh, and she says, the Midwest hook drug is an elusive creature, rarely identified by its makers and poorly documented in provenance and history. 
Many early rugs were sold out of the arena to collectors and disappeared after years of hard use. But we can find some clues to help us unravel how hooked rugs arrived in the Midwest and adapted to their new environment. So all of this is an interesting sort of um, conversation because, you know, when we talk about the history of rug hooking and its origins in uh, uh, the sort of maritime area of uh, Canada, right down northern New England, um, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, its crossover to the sea, to sailors, to thrumming, to all of these things that brought us away from the needle and, and uh, into the hook, the idea of using a hook instead. Now, the Midwest being so far sort of uh, in the interior, they don't have that same history, they don't have the same geography, and they're not going to have the same story. So she poses the question, so how do they make their way to the Midwest? How does hooking as a hobby uh, make its way. How does, you know, when you don't have that history of seeing rugs scattered around, seeing a rug for sure in front of every hearth, you know, when you don't have that as part of your DNA, how do they sort of emerge as um, an important part of, of life, an important sort of uh, job of a, a woman or anybody to make these things for the house? How do you introduce that kind of an idea and why does it stick, right, with, with such a different landscape? So she talks about this a lot in this chapter about the actual rug. And she does go into, she in, in all of um, her writing, she does, she tells you what she's about to talk about. In this case, the origins of rug hooking. And then she backs way up and talks about just like, almost like a camera coming out of focus and panning much wider. Talks about the absolute beginning of that thing. And then she returns to the theme. So she's got a very, um, her way of writing is very easy to follow and it's very sensible, right? It makes a lot of sense. It's very intuitive. So she backs us out of this and then she starts talking about thrumming. So before she tells us the answers to these questions that will take the whole book to answer, um, she says the word thrum is derived from the German tram, um, which is not surprising because of course English is a Germanic language. We're using a lot of the same words. And a tram in German is a short, thick piece um, of a stump, right, to the end. So like an abbreviated piece of stump. Um, it, it becomes associated with fiber, right, over, over time. Just like, for example, um, pulp in trees um, becomes uh, associated with, with more like paper. Um, there, all of these transitions happen as time goes on. So tram becomes thrum. And a thrum means to stick two short pieces of yarn through something and twist into a knot, right? So this is all evolution. This is the language uh, as a moving target changing shape, and it will take on a nautical sort of um, um, association, right, sooner rather than later, years ago. So sh she, she traces the roots of this thrumming or tramming to Shakespeare and the Merry Wives of Windsor. And uh, there's a quote that says, there's her thrummed hat, uh, and the witches were credited with wearing thrummed caps. In other words, caps that had fabric sticking out of them. I, I'm, I'm going to say latch hook just to give you an idea of with a, a high pile, like that kind of a thing. Um, but interesting that she could bring it all the way back there. I'd never heard that. The most interesting of all is the fact that thrum mats were made anciently by sailors uh, no one knows how long ago, I'd definitely go along with that, out of canvas with short strands of yarn or rope pulled through. These were used to place in the ship's rigging where by the rough surfaces um, they took up the chafing ropes. So this would sort of soften everything that happened with the violence of the wind between the rope and like the mast. So they would add all of these thrums, sailors would, to make it all a bit softer on the hands. You know, you, you're going to get beat up if you're a sailor and you're out there in the wind. Um, but at least you could do things to temper all of this hard work. So thrumming becomes almost solely associated with sailors, um, at least in the 17th, 18th century, if not sooner. So she goes on to say, um, the writer personally knows a sailor who now makes many hooked rugs while off duty from a life-saving station on Cape Cod. I'm gonna have to write to her and ask who this is. Most of these are cotton strips which he dyes and are clipped to make a very fluffy mat. So in other words, he cuts them so they're not looped rugs, they have a pile. Uh, and old sailors along the shore in many a port and even inland towns now make hooked rugs, first cousins to thrum mats. 
So she's making that connection between the sea, between the nautical history of the thrumming to sailors and people who now um, have adopted these short pre, sort of pre-cut pieces of fabric using them as uh, elements to a hooked rug or a latch rug. There is an intriguing link between the sailor and the hooked rug in the Midwest. After being released from service in the War of 1812, some sailors headed west to start a new life. In one 1821 story from Missouri, a character called Harry Emigrant, like emigrant but emigrant, leaves behind the ocean to find a snug harbor in Missouri. Former shipmates joined the Inland River trade and became boatmen and raftsmen, exploring the West and participating in the fur trade. Since New Englanders played a large role in settlement of the Midwest, bringing with them skills in arts and utilitarian crafts such as thrumming, it is possible that rug hooking techniques were passed to later generations. So that is her sort of um, explanatory paragraph about the link between the how do you do it and, the, and how it got here in the Midwest. So that is a very satisfactory, I think, uh, response to the question she poses at the beginning of the chapter, how did rugs uh, make their way to the Midwest? How did this happen? She, gives a, she poses the question, she does a bit of history, and then she gives us what I think is a really solid explanation. And she talks about linen, cotton, and hemp feed sacks also being available as shippers switched from barrels to sacks, uh, and sack, like bag sacking, in the 1830s and 1840s. So even though we've talked about this before, I think this is a point that is worth repeating. This is so important in the rug hooking timeline. We went from barrels of cargo to sacks that were fiber that you could hook into in the 1830s and 1840s. So that is so important. That, that goes right at the beginning of our rug hooking timeline because this makes it possible for people who do not have access to extra sort of homespun materials to use for backing because they're using everything for sort of more practical uses, clothing, you know, bed, bedding, stuff like that, um, sailing, everything. But this is a really, really important point to say barrels were out, cloth was in because this opens up uh, the hobby to people who now just buy stuff at the store and will automatically get a sack that they know they can use for backing. This is a huge game changer. And this is one of the main reasons that hooking becomes popular in the middle 19th century, because now everybody has backing laying around and they don't want to waste it. And now they know what to do with it. So big, big, big game changer. Thrummed mittens have thrums on the inside. Interesting, Karen. Well, that makes a lot of sense because it would keep your hand, I, I would think, extra warm and soft, almost like having something fleece lined, right? Interesting. I wasn't looking at the thread. Uh, Anne says, the book was so fabulous, you're now reading Girl with a Pearl Earring. That's a great book. That is such a great book. Um, Jenna says, we have thrums and weaving, leftovers of warp or the loom. Absolutely. That's a great point. And Karen said the thrums um, have, um, thrummed mittens have thrums on the inside. So every, one thing leads to another, right? Once we get the ball going. Um, but I love what she's written in this chapter. Um, and she just to follow this thought through, getting away from the barrels, she talks about Hessian. You know, we, people tend to still say Hessian in um, Europe, but not so much here. Um, we say burlap more in North America at this point, but she says that people in Canada. Now I'm going to look for I'm going to look for verification that this is true, and I'm, sh I'm sure this book is fabulous, so I have no reason to doubt. But she's saying in North America we say burlap, in England they all say Hessian, but in Canada you say brin. I have not heard that before. So Anne, Canadians, can you chime in and say whether you say the word brin in place of burlap? Because I would love I would love to know that just for uh, memory museum here. The latter word, brin, has several meanings, including burlap, jute thread, or even rough silk. A brin bag was a burlap bag that held meal, salt, or other agricultural items. Brin, perhaps from the French word for stock, uh, referred to the rough fabric used to store feed and salt. So interesting. So you can see how, obviously this book is not for everybody. I think it's for us. but. Not everybody would be interested in this transition away from barrels to Bryn, Hessian burlap and talking about what the different things were used for. But we know that we're picturing that piece of fabric on somebody's lap with a bent nail in their hand getting ready to make one of the early hook drugs, right? And it becomes very exciting when you put it into context that way. So I'm going to pick this up tomorrow. We're going to be looking at uh, rugs in the Midwest 
um, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take Zoom probably off this week because I want to um, spend some time with the kids again and my mom. But um, I will do a full week of coffee times Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Friday for our cocktail night this week. And I'm gonna keep returning to this book until I feel we've brought out some of the main points so that you know what kinds of subjects she's covering, what the sort of flavor of this particular book is. Actually, I did finish it. I did finish it because I I bracketed off some little poems and stuff at the back. Poetry of the Rug is the last chapter. It's actually in the appendix. But I want to give you a real good feel for this book so you know if you want to um, buy it. It is, like I said, a great bedside book. It is that great balance between being well written, being interesting, um, and being cozy. So, anyway, we will return to that. You believe that's associated with the silkworm. Okay. And Anne says, You have not heard that term before. Uh, you know, I'm, I've never heard that term before either, and you know I went to college for textiles, so I was surprised that Bryn for me was a new word. I thought, man, I must be like Rumpelstiltskin out there taking a long nap, but um, I feel comforted to know that it is not an everyday word in Canada, and I've just never heard it before. Um, even in French, it's not a word that you would use in everyday conversation. Uh, interesting. So let's return to this tomorrow. There's a lot more to say about this book. Um, I, I highly recommend it. And you can you can wait and see if you want it, but I highly recommend it. And like I said, I put the affiliate link um, to it in the description of this and the links to everything else that are happening. Um, the Maud Lewis class that I put out, the ice cream sampler that I put out, um, a bunch of stuff this weekend, and, um, and the link to the Amy Oxford frames that really are so, so, so good. So I can't recommend them highly enough. I didn't know if I would struggle with the style of frame not having a sort of um, bottom support, not having like a body to it. Um, and I thought, how is this ever going to get this going to be super unwieldy? It's actually, for me, the easiest frame I've used, I think. Um, again, if I want to sit back in the couch cushions and like really nestle in there for hours, then I sit with my lap frame on my lap. But this has been super comfortable sitting up at tables and putting, my mother puts, you know those sort of, they look like styrofoam, those yoga blocks, they weigh like nothing. She has a big one of those that she does her yoga and things with. She puts it under the thing and she punches right into it uh, because it's thick, but it's not super, super thick. She wants it angled like a sort of a, a draftsman's table. So she puts one of those blocks under it and, you know, and, and the point, and she often puts, um, when she's working on a table, which she likes to do because she likes to stand and punch my mom. Um, she's at her spirituality class or else she'd be with us right now. She puts one of those quilting scar proof mats under it just to be sure that the tip doesn't go into the dining room table and make everybody have a super good mood, right? Damage the dining room table. Um, so yeah, she does that little precaution too. She uses those two things to be able to stand and punch with it. But man, it is, it is a lot of fun. You should check them out. I was not aware of them until recently and, and I've got a couple. I'll probably end up getting them in all sizes. Have a great afternoon. It was great to see you. Happy Monday. Great to be together. Um, loved bingo the other night. Looking forward to a great full week of coffee time. And uh, I will see you. Is the cat going to be a kit? To, I think you must mean the Maud Lewis class, uh, um, class, the Maud Lewis uh, piece I'm working on. And yes, it's definitely going to be a kit. That's why it was so important to me. You know what? It's right here. Let me show you. It was so important for me to dye the right color for um, the distant sort of hill. Um, so I have the two cats under here, and they're cut off, like in here, because I'm not done yet. And I'm working the water. So this is all, this is all hand dyed stuff for me. And then close up, if I can, my shoulder still hurts a little bit. Let me stand. Um, here I've got this sort of, this fabric, uh, this yarn. This is all three-ply Briggs and Little that I get from the Maritime family. Um, this is all hand-dyed. Sky is all hand-dyed, so I know what I did. But I felt like I wasn't quite sure about this color. And what I did was dye this yesterday. Let me show you close up, if you can see it. It's got, it looks a bit dark, but it's got lots of, lightsy bright season there, right? It's a bit of like a seaweedy look, but it's a bit more uh, light and golden in there. So I'm going to be really happy with this color. A little bit of purple and plum in here too. I put some purples and plums, and then I over dyed the whole thing with um, Brilliant Blue from ProChem. And I'm going to put this color right into this entire ledge, and it's going to pick up the two seagulls on top, 
and the black cat at the bottom. So I'm real happy with the way that this project is evolving. This is like the work, honestly, of like one day, not even a full day, because you know how things are busy. But, um, you know, the punching goes so, I'm using a regular punch with a three ply, goes so fast. You could equally hook it and get exactly the same result. So this will be available as a kit. And I am, um, I'm going to do this immediately after it uh, in velvet. And that will also be available as a kit with the whimsical butterflies that Maud loved, the very unnatural, colorful butterflies. Again, those crazy boomerang type flowers. So that'll be out too. Um, in anticipation of the class. And if you are taking the class, you are signed up for the class, you will end up with images like these, you will end up in the class with me, putting, with me sort of coaching, putting together these elements that are uniquely mod into compositions that will appeal to you the most. But yes, these will also be available as a kit. Thanks, Christine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, clean up my order sheet so it's um, down to one or two orders. And I think I'm, I'm gonna take their little butts over to the ocean a little bit later in the day when it's not so hot. They wanna, they wanna look for crabs in the rocks. So let's see, what, let's see what happens with that. I will see you tomorrow for coffee time. We'll continue talking about rug cooking in the Midwest. Have a great day, everybody.